Welcome to this video on the regression discontinuity design. What is the regression discontinuity design? So suppose um, you want to estimate treatment effects and um, you're not in the lucky situation in which treatment assignment is random. So um, the regression discontinuity design is a situation in which you can nevertheless um, estimate treatment effects if certain conditions um, hold. And what is done here is to exploit randomness that is related to a cutoff rule uh, determining who receives treatment. I'm going to provide examples in a minute. Um, so you, you're going to have a cutoff rule and um, there is some randomness and the randomness essentially determines whether um, you're just below or just above um, the cutoff with some variable that in the end of the day determines treatment. And that variation uh, we can think of as random. And uh, if this is the case, um, we can exploit it, as I said, to estimate treatment effects. And what people uh, sometimes call this is quasi-experimental variation. There are two versions of the regression discontinuity design, the sharp regression discontinuity design and the fuzzy regression discontinuity design, and we're going to see both. I'm going to start with the sharp regression discontinuity design. For the sharp regression discontinuity uh, design, there is a regression discontinuity. Um, and what we have there is, for instance, that d is equal to 1 if xi, that's an observed variable xi, is at least equal to a constant little c. So xi is observed, the constant little c is known. I'm writing here for instance because it could also be the other way around, right? That d is equal to 1 if x is uh, just below uh, that constant. But the argument is going to be exactly the same. Otherwise, um, d is equal um, to 0. Uh, so uh, x um, determines completely whether somebody is treated. What are examples? First example, um, think of um, an election. Here, um, the candidate um, who um, has at least 50% of the votes plus 1 will win. So 50% uh, uh, is uh, the cutoff. Or think of scholarships. Um, scholarships uh, uh, might be offered to x the x percent uh, best students in a cohort according to the GPA. So um, from the perspective of one student, um, it's not even known uh, what the cutoff is um, beforehand, um, but there will be a cutoff, um, and then um, you can think of it uh, as being random, whether your GPA is just below or just above the cutoff, um, if you're close to the cutoff with your um, GPA. One can um, uh, draw a figure like this. Uh, to illustrate this. So what you see here is a figure that is taken from an article by Imbens and Lemieux. Uh, this article uh, describes um, some uh, practical um, issues uh, related to the regression discontinuity design. So it's a good read. I can recommend it. And what we see here is um, this uh, black line. And that black line um, is the probability that d is equal to 1 for a given x, and um, in the example, um, the little c, the cutoff is um, 6. Uh, so um, at x i is equal to 6, um, that probability um, goes from 0 to 1. And sometimes what we see here is called a step function. Now, if this is the situation, then um, what we actually have is um, the following situation for um, the outcomes uh, that are observed. So again, um, here on the uh, horizontal axis, I'm going to have my x. Remember that the cutoff was 6. Um, and what I'm uh, seeing here is two curves. Okay, uh, so one above and one below. 
And these are the two potential outcomes um, to be um, uh, precise. The expectation of um, the two potential outcomes here, this is y1i uh, above and uh, y0i uh, below for a given um, x. Okay, uh, so um, in the example um, from before, x would be, um, for instance, the GPA or x would be um, the fraction of voters uh, who have voted for a particular candidate. Now, um, what you have is that uh, treatment assignment uh, changes from 0 to 1 um, at x i is equal to 6. So what that means is that up to 6, we observe uh, the expectation of y not um, i given x. And um, above 6, uh, we observe the expectation of um, y1 i given x is equal to x. And this is what is denoted here by this uh, black line. Um, that is um, uh, what we do observe in our data. Now, um, uh, of course, um, we have the two potential outcomes. So the other uh, dashed lines here is what is also there in the background, um, but what we don't observe. Okay, uh, so um, we, we don't observe, um, for instance, so if, if six is the cutoff for the GPA, um, if somebody has um, a GPA of four, uh, we don't observe um, what will happen um, if uh, somebody with a GPA of four uh, gets offered a scholarship, which is basically this uh, situation. So the, the difference between these two is always the treatment effect um, uh, conditional on uh, X, um, but um, uh, you know we're never going to observe actually uh, the expectation of Y1I given that X is equal uh, to four in this um, particular example. Now, the whole idea of um, uh, this approach here is to go local and to say, okay, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this um, only locally um, for um, x um, is um, uh, around 6, so very close to 6. And um, then we're going to argue that whether or not um, you're just above or just below 6, um, that's really random. Uh, so that's as good as um, randomization. So what we can do is we can basically um, compare uh, the uh, average outcome for those who have x just below 6 to the average outcome uh, for those who have uh, x just above 6. And this is going to tell us um, what the treatment effect is uh, given that x is equal to 6. Now, um, in order for all this to work, what we need to do is we need to make two assumptions. Um, the first assumption is sort of describing the situation in which we are. Um, so the situation is that there's a sharp discontinuity in the treatment assignment and sharp means um, uh, it really goes from zero to one um, when you cross um, that um, cutoff little c. And here again, um, I've uh, written this down uh, so that um, when you're above the cutoff, um, you have di is equal to one. And when you're below the cutoff, you have these i is equal to zero, but it could just as well be the other way around. Then you just have to turn around um, all, um, uh, all the results uh, that are gonna come. Um, so that assumption is uh, something that is relatively easy to verify. Why? Um, because you observe D and um, you uh, observe X, so you can just check in your data whether there's such a cutoff uh, C. And uh, normally um, your institutional background knowledge should tell you what she, C should be like or which value should uh, uh, C uh, should be. Now, the assumption number two is an assumption you cannot test uh, in contrast. Um, and assumption number two, in fact, is key. Um, so assumption number two is that the conditional expectations of the potential outcomes are actually continuous at the cutoff point. Okay, so when you move um, from just um, above um, uh, little c uh, to just below little c, 
um, then both of these uh, conditional uh, expectations will not jump themselves. Okay, uh, so if I just go back um, to the previous slide, um, you see this here. So the continuity assumption is that there is no jump in uh, the expectation of y1, no, um, to the left and to the right, um, uh, this uh, expectation is the same. Uh, so this, this one does not jump and this one does not jump. The only thing that's changing is that I'm not observing one of them anymore, but that I'm suddenly observing the other one when I move um, from uh, the left of the cutoff uh, to the right of the cutoff. So that's assumption number two here. Um, and then uh, that's already sort of it. Um, so um, once you're in such a situation, what you can do is um, you can estimate the size of the discontinuity of the outcome variable at the cutoff point. So to be precise, um, what you need to estimate is the limit from above um, uh, of the expectation of yi, yi is the observed outcome in your data given x is equal to x minus um, the limit from below. Um, of uh, the expectation of the outcome given that x i is equal to little x. Uh, so I'm al always taking the limit uh, for x approaching um, uh, c uh, from below or from the left in the figure. And here it's the limit for x approaching um, little c uh, from above or from the right. Um, and little c is the value um, I condition on uh, for x i in this uh, conditional expectation. Um, from that figure um, and our discussion, you already know that this discontinuity under the two assumptions is going to be equal to the average causal effect of treatment. So the difference between y1i uh, and y0i on average, conditional on xi being equal uh, to little c. And the reason for this is that Above the cutoff, I always observe y1i, and below, I always observe y0i. Okay, uh, so just to be clear uh, for the interpretation, what we should um, keep in mind is that this um, parameter delta SRD, um, SRD stands for sharp regression discontinuity, is the treatment effect for a specific subpopulation, namely for the subpopulation um, uh, of individuals um, for whom xi is um, close to uh, the cutoff. And that's also logical, right? Um, so when you take such an approach and, and think again of the scholarships, um, you're not going to learn um, what a scholarship um, does to people who are way above the cutoff, or you're not going to learn what a scholarship does to people who are uh, way below the cutoff. Um, you're only going to learn about the effect of the scholarship for people who are around the cutoff in terms of their value uh, of the GPA. However, uh, this is um, potentially a very uh, policy relevant um, treatment effect that you're estimating here because it's directly related to the question what the effect of changing the cutoff um, by a small amount would actually be, right? Uh, so, um, so if you, if you learn about um, the effect of a scholarship uh, for those who are uh, who have a value of the GPA around six, right? Um, and and you think about you know should I should I uh, move that cutoff a little bit to the left so that more people uh, who have a GPA around six actually get a scholarship? Um, for instance, people with a GPA between five point five and six, um, then um, you know uh, that is that is uh, exactly what you can answer. Um, uh, with this um, uh, with this parameter delta SRD that you can estimate here. So uh, that's actually quite cool, I would say. Now, uh, how do we estimate um, the size of the discontinuity? There are two approaches. Um, so uh, first of all, what do we need to estimate? Um, we need to estimate um, the conditional expectation of the outcome, uh, conditional on X um, uh, being just above um, the cutoff or x being just um, below the cutoff. So uh, denote these two um, uh, limits um, by mu r evaluated at c and mu l evaluated at c. Um, so uh, to the right and to the left 
uh, approaching uh, the cutoff from the le a right and from the left. Uh, so this is what R and L uh, stands for here. I said uh, there are two approaches. So approach one would be to estimate uh, those two uh, conditional means separately and then take the difference. Approach two is you directly estimate uh, the difference between those two. And what we're going to do for this is to run um, two regressions uh, for approach number one and one regression uh, for approach number two. So let's first uh, go through this uh, in detail for approach number one. The regressions uh, we're going to run is um, OLS regressions. So we're going to minimize respectively the sum of squared residuals. Um, and then here we're taking uh, data to the left of the cutoff. Here we're taking data uh, to the right of the cutoff, um, so the sum of squared residuals. Um, so let's first look at uh, which sum uh, we take. We use observations um, that are um, less than H um, units away from C. Okay, so Xi is um, between uh, C minus H and C. Okay, so we're going to select um, uh, i's um, locally uh, in terms using the value of uh, xi. And then what, am I, what, what are we going to use as a specification? Um, so this is the residual squared. So you can see from this that the specification is yi is equal to alpha l minus beta l xi minus c. Uh, and I'm going to show you a figure uh, in a minute. Um, that uh, shows you exactly what that means, um, because what's a little bit non-standard is that we uh, subtract um, a little c from the xi value. But this turns out to be quite useful here. Now, to the right of the cutoff, um, we do the exact same thing. We use i's um, that are um, equal to c, uh, where the xi is equal to c, or um, uh, you know smaller than uh, little c, plus h. So again, um, uh, less than h units of xi away from c. Um, and, and then we're going to run the exact same uh, specification. Notice that the parameters are uh, similar. Um, here we have beta l, here we have beta r, here we have alpha l, here we have alpha r. What we get from this is estimates uh, mu hat l of c and mu hat r of c. These are just fitted values. Um, so it's going to be alpha hat l plus beta hat l c minus c. So that's alpha hat l. And um, here we get uh, mu hat r evaluated at c. So that's going to be alpha hat r plus um, beta hat r c minus c. So that's alpha hat r. So I have these two estimates of these uh, uh, two conditional expectations. I can take the difference between the two estimates that will estimate the size of my discontinuity. Um, and um, uh, as I said before, we're going to do all this uh, locally. So we uh, use only data where x is at most or is less than h units away on either side of, uh, side of the cutoff point, And h is called bandwidth. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the bandwidth a little bit um, uh, at a later point. Good. I promised a figure. So here's the figure. Uh, what do you see here? You see basically the specification. Uh, so um, I've written down up here um, what we have already seen uh, on the previous slide. Um, so another way to write this down is that um, I have two um, specifications for respectively the conditional expectation of the outcome given x. Um, so as I said before already, it's alpha l plus beta l x i minus c if uh, x i is less than c and um, alpha r plus beta r uh, x i minus c if x i is um, greater or equal than c. And um, you can see here in this figure how this all looks like. Um, so on the horizontal axis, I have xi. Um, c is my cutoff. Um, here's my average outcome in the sense of the conditional expectation of uh, uh, y uh, given x. Um, uh, when I uh, have a value of xi below c, then di is equal to 0. Um, when I have a value of xi above c, then di is equal to 1. 
um, so um, C is the cutoff again, and, uh, and the cutoff uh, completely determines, um, like Xi together with the cutoff completely determines um, a treatment because we're in a sharp regression uh, discontinuity uh, design. Um, now, uh, I have a slope um, of this conditional expectation in Xi uh, to the left of the cutoff, so that's gonna be my parameter beta L. I have a slope, um, uh, to the right of the discontinuity for that conditional expectation, um, the dependence on x, that's going to be beta r. Um, and um, what is now so convenient is that when xi is equal to c, uh, then um, the second term actually goes away, because then I'm going to have c minus c, so the whole beta r part goes away. So when xi is equal to c, then um, uh, I'm going to have here alpha r, and here I'm going to have alpha l, okay? Uh, so um, basically my intercept term is estimated not uh, when xi is equal to zero, but when xi is uh, equal um, to little c. That's one uh, way to think about it. And um, this is convenient because then I can simply take these two alpha um, hats, so alpha hat r and alpha hat l, and um, estimate um, from them, take the difference, and that estimates the size of the discontinuity. Good. Approach number two is um, maybe even better. Uh, so what we can do here is um, alternatively um, to um, run one regression, a slightly different um, but very similar um, uh, specification. So again, we're going to use xi's that are uh, less than h away um, from the uh, uh, from the uh, cutoff. Um, so c plus h uh, here, c minus h. So all the xi's in between. Um, uh, and then uh, what what we're going to use now is another specification. We're going to have um, um, a partially uh, piecewise linear specification with a discontinuity at c. That's uh, how you could uh, describe it. So yi is equal to alpha plus beta xi minus c plus gamma di xi minus c plus delta di. And I'm going to show you a figure um, right away um, so that um, uh, you see what that means. Um, uh, just observe for now that um, in the end of the day, um, uh, we're going to care about uh, this coefficient here, delta. Uh, that's the coefficient on di. Um, again, di is observed. Um, I'm sorry, uh, di is observed. Um, so we're going to run this regression, and then we're going to look at uh, our estimate of delta. And that's going to be directly our estimate of the size of the discontinuity. And we know that this is um, equal uh, to um, uh, the size of the discontinuity is um, the effect that we're actually interested in. And again, we use um, uh, a bandwidth uh, h, little h, so we're going to do this locally. So here's the figure. Um, up there is the specification, so alpha plus beta xi minus c plus gamma di xi minus c plus uh, delta di. We know that di is equal to 1 here to the right um, of the discontinuity. That's the exact same thing as in the figure uh, we saw before. So let's first um, look at um, the left-hand side uh, or the, the area to the left uh, of um, c. Um, so um, when di is equal to 0, then this third term is, e is going to be equal to 0 and the fourth term is going to be equal to 0. So what I'm going to have is alpha plus beta xi minus c. So that's the exact same specification as we had before, uh, just with different um, uh, parameters. Um, and now uh, this point here is going to be alpha, as you can see here. Um, so when xi is equal to little c, um, then my uh, conditional expectation of yi given xi um, is going to be equal to alpha, and I'm going to have a slope of uh, beta. Now, to the right um, of um, uh, little c, what I'm going to have is um, an intercept term that is equal to, so let's, let's first um, set um, xi to um, 
uh, zero, um, but um, let's uh, now uh, set di um, to one. So then I'm gonna have alpha plus, this is gonna be equal to zero because xi is equal to c, uh, plus gamma um, times di, but then again zero. So this is gonna go away. Um, so what's um, left is then delta times di. So it's gonna be alpha plus delta. Um, so alpha plus delta. And here you see already that what you're really interested in is gonna be uh, that delta, uh, as I already said um, before. Um, and finally, um, the slope here to the right um, of uh, C is gonna be uh, beta plus um, uh, gamma, because then di is equal uh, to one. So um, when xi increases by one unit, um, then uh, that conditional expectation here is gonna increase by beta plus gamma. So that's it. Now, um, one question that remains is how to choose the bandwidth eight h. Um, so, uh, what what we have imposed here is linearity. Okay, so you can think of this as an approximation, and uh, in general, there's a trade-off between uh, bias and variance. Okay, so because in in general, uh, the true relationship is not exactly linear. Uh, however, in practice, I can tell you that linearity is often a very good approximation unless you have tons and tons of data. Um, uh, so it works normally uh, just fine. Um, so um, so what you're gonna have is um, that usual uh, bias variance trade-off. Uh, so if you have more and more data, you, would, you wanna uh, choose uh, smaller and smaller uh, ages. Uh, so um, uh, unless, of course, the true relationship is really linear, right? In that case, you just wanna use all the data you have. Um, uh, more detail on this um, in that um, article uh, by Imbens and Lemieux. Uh, here's the reference, you can just Google it and uh, look it up. Um, uh, you're data scientists, uh, so you have seen that actually before. So one thing one can do is uh, one can do uh, cross-validation. Um, so uh, in, in, in the usual way, I would say. You can have a holdout sample and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, uh, there's not much different. Uh, what is a little bit different uh, is this whole uh, local business, um, but I don't want to go into details here in this presentation. Um, here's the reference. In case you want to do this uh, yourselves, um, if you download a package uh, that implements all this, um, then uh, normally this is all built in uh, already, uh, so uh, you don't have to worry about the details. Um, uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, programming uh, stuff um, yourselves, but you should understand uh, that there's some procedure in the background uh, that optimally chooses the bandwidth. What are possible refinements? Um, so one thing one can do is actually, um, since we're running regressions, we can just add covariates. Um, and what this helps us with is um, precision of our estimates. Um, and um, it can also reduce bias for observations further away from C. So when we choose a big bandwidth um, and we include observations um, further away from C, so if we uh, control for covariates, then the uh, linear relationship, uh, intuitively speaking, becomes less uh, important um, and uh, um, you know, it, it and the, the slope decreases uh, intuitively. Um, and, and in that sense, it can reduce bias. Uh, that's a very vague uh, motivation, I realize that, um, but um, the main one uh, that people um, uh, normally use is uh, that uh, they, they wanna increase the precision of the estimate. So they wanna explain more of the variation in the data. So there's less um, uh, variation left in the residuals. In that sense, uh, you can estimate those uh, conditional expectations more precisely. Um, Second thing people talk about is to use higher order polynomials in Xi. Um, so um, I've used first order linear, right? Um, but in fact, you should be really careful. So I, I put this here basically to tell you that you should be careful. Um, so uh, linear in some sense is uh, just fine. Maybe you can go quadratic, uh, but you shouldn't go beyond that. The reason is that out of sample predictions or predictions at the boundary and, and, and that con discontinuity is in some sense uh, uh, the boundary of, uh, of two uh, uh, ranges uh, for the Xi. Um, 
uh, so so predictions uh, you know out of sample or at the boundary are not so great uh, when you use higher order polynomials that is a point that Gelman and Imbens have made in a 2018 uh, JBS uh, article uh, so please um, uh, don't uh, try to fit the data so you, again your data scientists uh, so what what's going on then is something that's a little bit like overfitting right uh, so you want to be really careful here um, final thing, and that is something um, that, um, you know, uh, is less of a problem. That's probably a good idea. What you can do is you can use weights, okay, uh, and, and basically put more weight on observations closer to the cutoff. Um, when you choose that bandwidth um, in the way um, I've said it uh, before, um, then uh, what you do is you, you give all observations equal weight that are in this window around um, uh, the cutoff, uh, but you might want to uh, refine that and put uh, more weight on the observations that are closer to the cutoff and a bit less weight uh, on observations uh, that are further away. Um, that's about uh, what I want to say about this here. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's easy to find uh, references for this. And again, packages uh, will uh, implement that um, usually um, anyway. Uh, so you can choose that as an option. Good. So let's look at um, an example. Um, I talked about uh, uh, winning elections uh, before. So here's a, an example from Lee, um, 2008 Journal of Econometrics. Um, the point here is that politicians of um, a ruling party can use the time in office to increase their electoral chances for the next election. Um, but it's not so easy um, to, um, to estimate um, how big um, this effect actually is um, because more skillful politicians are more likely to win the first election in the first place. Uh, so... Um, in a two-party system, there's a discontinuity at 50% of the votes. Um, and uh, the approach here is to compare um, what happens in the second election. If in the first election, um, uh, a politician just won versus uh, just didn't win. Okay, uh, so it's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, thing to do. Here's how it looks. Um, so... Um, uh, so here you have um, the democratic vote share, um, so margin of victory, election T. Uh, so that's the first election. And here you have um, whether they win again in election uh, T plus one. And what you see is um, that um, when they just win, um, uh, when they just win uh, in, uh, in T, uh, then uh, that probability is something like 60%. And uh, when they don't win uh, and just don't win, uh, then it's about uh, uh, 10, 15%. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, the effect is actually positive, right? Uh, so this is the effect of just winning. Okay. Um, what you see here, by the way, is... Um, the whole thing uh, done for a binary uh, outcome variable yi. yi is whether you win in the next election. And for that reason, um, uh, they have used actually a logit model uh, to estimate um, that condition expectation. But um, the approach is the exact same approach. The only uh, difference is that you use um, a logit model uh, to estimate the conditional expectation of the outcome um, uh, given x uh, instead of a linear regression. Um, so you could, could have also done a linear probability model. A logit model just uh, uh, estimates this uh, with maximum likelihood imposing uh, a particular functional form, um, in a different functional form than linearity um, and is more efficient uh, than, uh, uh, than a local linear regression. Uh, but, you know, the connection between the two is obviously that the expectation of a binary variable is a probability, right? Uh, so keep that in mind. So in that sense, um, it's all um, consistent uh, with one another. Good. So this brings me uh, to um, the other regression discontinuity design uh, that we um, that we have, and that would be the fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So the sharp one um, had di change from 0 to 1 uh, when x uh, crossed uh, that threshold, little c. 
Um, instead, what we now have is a uh, jump or discontinuity in that probability, but it is um, not necessarily from zero to one. Okay, so um, what I've written down here is that um, when x is uh, just above, when xi is equal to x, and I take the limit um, uh, to z, c uh, from above um, of that um, probability, then it is different uh, than uh, when I take the limit uh, from below. Um, so, um, and again, uh, think of, um, of that probability as uh, jumping, uh, but by less than uh, one. What are examples for this? Um, so think of um, legal drinking age and alcohol consumption, right? Uh, so um, when uh, people uh, become eligible uh, or uh, are allowed to uh, drink alcohol, um, then not everybody uh, will uh, start drinking right away. Um, and also not everybody uh, has not been drinking uh, before reaching that age. Uh, but um, you can think of um, there being um, a discontinuity in that probability. Um, uh, and another example, and that's again uh, related to the scholarships. Uh, so before I talked about this, in a way as if you would always take it if you get it. Uh, so um, um, what you can also think about is a more... Um, uh, yeah, refined situation in which uh, people who are um, above little c with their uh, GPA xi uh, are being offered a scholarship, um, but they might not take it, right? Uh, so the probability of um, uh, taking one is always zero uh, when xi is below c, but it might not be one uh, when uh, xi is uh, just above um, c. Uh, people might just change their mind uh, and might do something else, might not need a scholarship, uh, so therefore uh, that probability will also uh, jump, but by less than um, one. So again, this is what we had before here, sharp regression discontinuity design, probability jumps from zero to one, and therefore here we had the two potential outcomes. We observe uh, why not i up to uh, the threshold, and afterwards we observe y1i. Um, what is happening now is um, uh, a little bit different. Uh, so um, here you have the probability that d is equal to 1. Let us say increasing in xi could be decreasing, could be anything. Um, the key point is that it does um, jump um, uh, up uh, from this value here to that value here, and then it might again uh, depend uh, on xi. Okay, so that's the probability. Here you have again the two potential outcomes, but they're now both um, do, uh, dashed all the time. And why is that? Because um, as you can see here, the probability to be treated is always between zero and one. So that means that the observed outcome is always an average actually, a, a weighted average uh, between uh, y not i and y1 i, right? Uh, so uh, let's let's look at this in more detail. Um, so at x i is equal to four, uh, the probability to be treated is about, um, uh, so I say 0.25, right? Uh, so is about 0.25. So that means that um, this, uh, this value here is 0.25 um, times the expectation of y not i plus 1 minus 0.25, so 0.75 times the expectation of um, y1 i. Okay, so this is what we observe. Um, and then here, you know, like you have a discontinuous jump uh, in, in this uh, probability, so therefore um, we're going to have a jump here in what we observe simply because the weights. Um, that I put on y not i and y one i are going to jump um, at the discontinuity or at the cutoff value. Good. So, which assumptions do we need? Um, we need an assumption uh, that is uh, pretty much the assumption uh, from before, namely that the conditional expectations of the potential outcomes are continuous uh, at the cutoff point. That is the exact same uh, assumption that we had. Uh, have already made. Um, the second assumption is also very similar to uh, 
an assumption we made before. Uh, so before we assume that the probability to be treated uh, jumps from zero to one. Now, of course, uh, it is that um, it jumps, but it doesn't have to jump from zero to one. And the third condition is um, that, um, and that is now new, uh, that um, the expectation of uh, y not i given xi is equal to c, and the expectation of y one i given xi is equal to c to actually not depend on di. Okay, so why do we need that? We need that because um, uh, we want to have a situation in which there is no selection um, into the treatment locally. Okay, um, so um, remember that um, in general, um, it does not hold uh, that the expectation of y not i um, conditional on di is um, equal to the expectation of y not i and that would also for that reason uh, not hold uh, in general um, uh, if we in addition uh, conditional on x a condition on x um, so um, so what this is really saying is that um, uh, there's a homogeneity assumption um, uh, locally so all people uh, who have an x i um, that is um, equal to c or very close to c um, uh, for for all of those people treatment assignment is essentially going to be as good as random that's what this assumption is saying good now uh, let's look at something uh, you know a little bit more technical uh, related to um, how this all works. Um, so I told you already that um, the, um, the the jump um, in the uh, observed outcome in the, in the expectation of the observed outcome is directly related um, to um, the jump in the treatment probability. What I'm doing here now is um, to make this statement much more precise. Okay, so let's go step by step. So the expectation of the observed outcome is that weighted average that I already talked about. And that's also true, um, of course, uh, that is true conditional on x uh, in that figure because I've been plotting stuff against x. Okay, so what I'm going to observe is 1 minus the probability that um, i is treated conditional on x times the expectation of y not i uh, given x plus uh, the probability that a person is treated times the expectation of y one i given x. Okay, so it's it's really just that weighted average, um, as I said before. And now I can rewrite that. So um, here I have the probability uh, that somebody is treated, and here I have the probability. I can simply write that as the expectation of y not i given x is equal to a little x plus the probability that i is treated given x times the treatment effect okay so the treatment effect is the expectation of y1 i given x is equal to x minus y not i given x is equal to x so this is the thing we're actually after this is the thing we're actually interested in and um from this um equation here you already see um the main result actually so when um uh locally right around um x i is equal to c um that probability here uh, jumps, then this will uh, create a jump in the expectation of yi that is directly related to this object of interest here. So um, let's look at this um, more formally or in more detail. So um, once I make these three assumptions on the previous slide, what I have is uh, that um, the uh, discontinuity um, in the expectation of yi given xi, so that would be the limit from above of that expectation minus the limit from below is equal to, and now I need to um, just um, look at this whole expression here and just work out what it is when I take the limit from above and the limit from below. So this thing here is always going to be the same. So the only thing that's going to change is that treatment probability. And then I take the difference between these two things. Um, so, um, so I'm getting um, uh, 
the difference in the treatment probability times the effect of interest. And um, yeah, uh, for, for that reason, um, the parameter uh, that I'm interested in, delta FRD, fuzzy regression discontinuity design, which is defined, uh, so this is this uh, identity here, as the uh, expectation of Y1i um, condition on xi is equal to Z, c uh, minus the expectation of y not i given that xi is equal to c is given by this um, uh, fraction here. Why do I get this fraction? Because here um, I have um, uh, my um, uh, jump in the um, condition expectation of the observed outcome. And um, here, this is the effect I'm interested in. So I'm, all I'm doing is I take this equation here and I divide by this um, uh, jump in the treatment probability. Okay, so this follows directly um, from just bringing this stuff here to the other side of the equation and uh, writing uh, uh, this one here, um, just flipping sides, basically. Okay, and that's also intuitive. Um, so um, what I get is, um, a jump in the observed outcome and that is driven by a change in the probability uh, so if the change in the probability would be one as in the sharp um, uh, regression uh, discontinuity design um, then the denominator would simply be equal to one right and this is exactly then the result that we had before so before we had the result that our effect of interest is uh, the jump in the outcome okay uh, the discontinuity in the outcome now if only 20% um, of the of the people, um, uh, you know, uh, if the treatment probability changed from 30% uh, to 50%, then the jump in the outcome is actually driven by 20% of the people. Uh, so in order to um, to get the full jump, what I need to do is I need to uh, divide by 0.2. Um, so I need to basically uh, take the observed jump and multiplied by five. That's what's happening here. Good, uh, so that's our result. Uh, so our um, effect of interest is this uh, delta. It's equal to this uh, expression here. So the jump in the outcome divided by the jump in the treatment probability. And in order to estimate it, we need to basically estimate two um, discontinuities and take the ratio uh, or we can uh, uh, estimate um, yeah four numbers and then first get the difference between the first two and then the difference between the second two and then take the ratio afterwards okay so what we do is we we run uh, four uh, linear regressions um, and again what you see is the specification is exactly the same specification as before so we're always going to have um, a yi regressed on an alpha and a beta uh, times xi minus c. Okay, um, and in addition to what we had before, we're also going to now have such regressions for the di. Okay, so before we had the first two here, um, and uh, now we um, uh, add uh, those other two. And then the effect of interest is then really just um, uh, calculated from all these uh, alphas uh, that I'm going to get. Good, uh, so an alternative um, that turns out uh, to work quite well is to estimate the effect actually directly, but then we have to do something a little bit more than what we did before. Um, so um, again, uh, what we wanna do is we wanna restrict the sample. Oh, by the way, like on the previous slide here, um, again, uh, we have restricted the sample, right? Uh, so here you have again, uh, that you would only use observations i that are at most or less than h away from uh, c in terms of the xi. Uh, same thing here, um, restrict the sample so that the xi is um, uh, not too far away from uh, little c. Then specify an outcome equation. So this is actually the equation uh, that we used um, for, um, for the second uh, approach um, for the sharp uh, regression discontinuity. Uh, the one thing that we do now is a little bit different um, because um, before uh, di just uh, went from zero to one, right? Uh, when xi uh, 
uh, went from just below uh, little c to just above little c and now that's not the case anymore so what we need to do is we need to somehow uh, bring into the picture uh, this uh, treatment probability but when you think about it that's like a first stage uh, from an iv regression right uh, so di the conditional expectation of di is the treatment probability um, so um, uh, what you can do is you can uh, define a variables little z i um, and these variables little z i um, are defined as uh, being uh, above or below um, little c okay z i is equal to one if x i is uh, greater or equal uh, than uh, little uh, c uh, this is not on the slide let me just add that Okay, so we here we have it. Uh, Z i is equal to one if x i is greater or equal than c and uh, zero otherwise. So um, we use um, that indicator, that dummy variable uh, z i as an instrument for d i um, and um, z i uh, times x i minus uh, c as an instrumental variable uh, for d i. Uh, times x i minus c. Okay, uh, so uh, you have uh, d i appear in two places here, here and here. And um, what you do is uh, for this one here, you use uh, z i uh, as an instrument, and for this one here, you use z i times x i minus um, c as an instrument. That's just um, in a way ad hoc, um, but um, it actually um, works. Uh, so it turns out um, that this estimates um, uh, also the ratio of these two uh, discontinuities um, uh, using our data. Good. Um, so let's think about um, some specification testing uh, that you could do. Before we actually had uh, three assumptions, I want to concentrate now um, on the first two, actually. Uh, so this third assumption that uh, treatment um, assignment is as good as random uh, around the cutoff um, is a little bit more difficult uh, to, um, uh, to justify uh, using the data and, and, and to tie it um, uh, with, to, to specification testing, so I don't want to. I don't want to talk about this here. Um, there are things you can do, but that's for a different uh, time. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, assumption number one and two. Um, so, um, what are possible things that uh, can go wrong? Uh, so, first of all, um, it could be that um, there is actually no discontinuity um, in uh, the treatment. Um, assignment that probability um, uh, that uh, d is equal to 1, which by the way is equal to the expectation of di, that is the same thing. So here I've written it as the expectation of di uh, doesn't have a discontinuity. Um, uh, this will be a problem, but you will know about it um, because you will look at the data, you will look at um, you, you will, um, you know, when you think it's a fuzzy regression discontinuity design, you will estimate the jump uh, in, in, in that uh, probability to be treated. Um, so if you estimate this to be zero, uh, then you know that um, this is not a good approach for you. Um, and when you have a sharp regression discontinuity design, you just have to inspect your data and you will see whether it works, right? Um, just to verify. Um, uh, so number one is in a way um, easy. Uh, number two is not so easy, um, and I said before already uh, that um, this assumption is to some extent um, untestable. It's an identifying assumption, so uh, it's an assumption we need to make in order to learn something from the data. But we can um, we can uh, you know always try to uh, find supportive evidence. Um, so let's think about what can go wrong. Um, so first of all, it could be that other changes happen at the cutoff point. Um, uh, so it could be that, um, uh, you know, uh, that X variable, um, uh, is something like age, right? And you turn 18 and, you know, at 18, uh, many things happen, right? Uh, so you cannot really look at an outcome and, uh, say, you know, 
the jump in that outcome is uh, related to one thing, right? It's basically then coming from uh, turning 18, but why exactly uh, that has an effect on the outcome, you then uh, can't really say. The second thing that can go wrong is uh, that uh, people actually manipulate XI, okay? Um, so, um, uh, so people selectively change behavior around the cutoff point. Um, so um, for instance, it could be the students who benefit from scholarship the most, um, you know, retake many tests uh, so that um, they uh, are above the bar uh, with their uh, GPA. Um, all knowing that they actually know uh, what that uh, threshold is, right? In my example before, uh, that was not known because it was the best ex-students uh, um, who uh, got the scholarship or got offered a scholarship. Um, but if the cutoff is known, right, uh, then people might just retake uh, tests uh, until they um, are above uh, that cutoff. Um, so what can we do? Um, so as I said, we can directly test whether there's a discontinuity in the treatment probability, we can show a figure, um, we can perform statistical tests. Uh, so that's uh, relatively straightforward. Um, um, then uh, for the other thing that can go wrong, that there are other changes at the cutoff. Uh, so first of all, we can assess empirically whether other changes actually happened. Uh, so we can look at um, other um, variables um, that could be also like there could be potential treatments, right? Um, uh, when you, for instance, turn 18, um, it could have an impact on many things like, you know, you driving a car now, you drinking, you doing this, that, whatever. So you can just see actually, uh, try to see in your data whether um, these things all happen, right? Or actually whether actually just one thing happens. Uh, so most likely in this case, uh, many things will happen, but um, you know, um, uh, you get the idea. Um, the other thing you can do, um, and this relates to the manipulation or retaking uh, that test um, that I talked about before, um, you can actually test whether the density of the XI variable is continuous around the cutoff point C. Okay, and that is uh, called the McCrary test. Uh, he came up with that. Um, so um, continuity of that density of XI is not a formal assumption for RDD, um, uh, but um, if that density is not uh, continuous um, at a cutoff, um, it could be a sign that XI was manipulated. Okay, um, and uh, the other thing you can do um, to address concerns um, is uh, a placebo test um, for the discontinuity and other outcomes uh, or covariates um, that should actually not be affected uh, by the treatment. So you basically say, uh, you know, here I should find um, a zero effect. I um, do the analysis with this outcome and I do actually find a zero effect. Um, so that um, is a little bit like the uh, placebo uh, test um, that you have seen in the context of uh, differences in differences estimation where you use um, multiple uh, pre-treatment uh, periods uh, to do a placebo test. So um, now uh, a brief um, uh, example um, uh, for that uh, manipulation um, and the density of X. Uh, so what would be the density of X? So here you have an example um, uh, where you have an income tested job training program. Okay, income tested means um, you only get into the program um, when your income is below the threshold. Um, so um, uh, on the left hand side, you have A and C. Uh, so A is uh, the conditional expectation of the returns to the treatment with no pre announcement and no manipulation. So what you see here is um, uh, the conditional expectation of the uh, outcome, basically. Um, um, here, um, B uh, and D would always have manipulation. And what I talked about in particular was this density. So if in the population, the income distribution is like this, and people who are um, uh, above this income threshold really try to get into the program um, uh, by manipulating the income, that means they somehow make sure they earn less, uh, then it will actually uh, look like this, right? So it will it will shift probability mass uh, from the right uh, to the left 
uh, of the cutoff. Okay, um, and if this is the case, um, then uh, you will see basically that people who uh, benefit uh, from that program actually do the manipulation. So it will shift people to the left and then these people will actually benefit from the program. So they will actually earn more. Right. And, and you, see, you see here discontinuity in the outcome um, that is, uh, however, uh, driven by this manipulation. OK, and is not driven by an effect because uh, what you see here is um, uh, actually no effect uh, of that program. OK, uh, so um, it looks as if there was an effect, but that there is actually no effect. And you can detect that by looking at the density um, of the uh, X variable. And, uh, you know, you see that this density has a jump and that shouldn't be the case. Uh, so that is the, the continuity that I talked about and that uh, uh, McCrary um, based uh, this test on. So basically his test is whether there is a jump in this um, uh, density. Now, uh, let's look at another example, um, just to illustrate um, uh, what, we, what we have seen. Um, so that's based on a study by uh, Carpenter and Dobkin. Um, so in, in the US, the drinking age uh, is 21, unlike here. Um, and uh, at 21, um, less things happen in the US than here. So for instance, uh, you know, uh, you, you're allowed to drive a car uh, when you, uh, turn 16, uh, so uh, that doesn't coincide. Um, so the majority of the adolescents uh, do drink before age 21, but um, it is actually the case uh, empirically uh, that turning 21 has a positive effect on drinking. And uh, that is simply the case because it's an easier uh, to drink in uh, restaurants and bars, right? Um, uh, because um, people actually check this uh, in the US more than they do in Europe, I would say. Um, so uh, what they do in this paper is they use a quadratic uh, specification um, and uh, they show um, uh, results based on that. Uh, so yi is uh, either drinking variable or mortality actually. Uh, mortality is the outcome they're interested in. So they're interested in learning about the effect of uh, drinking on Ah, uh, uh, mortality, dying. Uh, so, and and uh, they also use a local linear regression, but I'm not going to show you results here. This is what they get. Uh, so uh, here you have age. 21 is the uh, cutoff age. Um, and um, here they plot various things here. Uh, so uh, you have drinks per day and uh, pop... A proportion of days drinking. Uh, so here uh, up there is uh, drinks per day. Uh, you see it jumps up a little bit. Um, proportions of days drinking jumps up a little bit. Um, and then here you have the proportion of days heavy drinking. So it would be uh, more than five day drinks on a on a day. Um, so here you have also a jump uh, at uh, 21. Okay, so this is going to be uh, your treatment. Uh, variable. Uh, so you see that they have um, uh, created um, discrete variables and uh, zero one variables. Um, um, no, not really. So what they have actually done here is um, uh, they have they have um, looked at a, a treatment that is a little bit more continuous, right? Uh, drinks per day, proportion of days drinking and proportion of days heavy drinking. Um, and here you see the outcome variable. Uh, so um, what you see here is um, the deaths uh, per 100,000 uh, person years. Um, and uh, it's split up by internal and external um, sources. Um, so internal means something like uh, committing suicide. External uh, means um, uh, being hit by a car, etc. Or having... Uh, uh, an accident, um, yeah, you see it's basically driven by uh, uh, external uh, sources. Um, uh, so uh, the drinking days at age 21 increased by around 10%, um, uh, and mortality increases by 4.3%. Um, uh, and uh, at age uh, 21, uh, there is no jump in other covariates.
okay uh, so um, uh, in that sense uh, you learn something about uh, the effect of drinking on uh, mortality now uh, to finish um, what are the key concepts uh, that we have learned something about um, we have learned uh, the difference between the sharp and the fuzzy uh, regression discontinuity design and we have learned how we can estimate causal effects um, uh, for both um, and uh, for both of them we have uh, seen uh, uh, different approaches uh, to estimation. We have talked about uh, the bandwidth um, and that there is some bandwidth uh, choice uh, that you have to make. Uh, we've uh, talked about a weighting that uh, you might want to put more weight to observations that are uh, closer uh, to the uh, cutoff. Um, and we have talked about um, the McCrary test um, that tests um, whether the density of uh, that variable x um, has a jump at, um, at the cutoff as well. And um, if the variation around the cutoff is as good as random, um, then uh, we would expect there not to be a jump. So if we find one, it's not uh, um, always um, a problem but it, um, it is uh, considered uh, supporting evidence if we don't find a jump um, in, in comforting, uh, if we don't find a jump of uh, the density of xi uh, at the cutoff. So in that sense, um, that test is um, actually very useful. So this ends uh, my discussion of the regression discontinuity design. Um, there's a very powerful method um, that you can often use um, uh, when you uh, don't have a random assignment. Um, so I hope uh, you find, found this presentation helpful. And um, with this, all the best.